most remarkable instances of a ruthlessness and indifference to common humanity which the darkest centuries of European history can scarcely parallel. Hitler has annexed the whole of the Czechoslovak state, has, without flickering an eyelid, made a pact with Russia, a country the denouncing and reviling of which has been his chief stock in trade ever since he became Chancellor. All right, it's World War II time, and we get to see if Robert Menzies really was Britain's puppet. Well, nearly. We've got to deal with Joseph Lyons first. And for Lyons, basically imagine Jerry from Rick and Morty being an Aussie politician from the 30s, and you have our 10th Prime Minister. If you missed last week's episode on Jack Lang, essentially Lyons used to be part of Labor, but after having the Treasury denied to him, he defected to the opposition and led the new United Australia Party. After winning the 1932 election, Lyons became the nation's Prime Minister, and he had a couple of things going for him. Firstly, he was a Catholic. Remember, in the 1930s, most Australians had at least a cultural association with a Christian denomination, and would often support a candidate on those grounds alone. Labor had a huge Catholic base, while the Tories were largely Protestant. And with a lot of Labor voters disgruntled over the internal wars between Lang and Scullin, many Labor voters were keen to flip for Lyons because he was ex-Labor and a Catholic. Secondly, he was loved by the Murdoch press. So much has been made about the current Murdoch press's fan for the Liberal Party and vitriol towards Labor. But with Labor committed to another budget later this year, we can expect all sorts of broken promises, perhaps. Perhaps some funding cuts, maybe some tax increases. Who knows? But what you might not know is that Rupert Murdoch's father, Keith, was the OG. You see, Keith Murdoch was very supportive of Lyons defecting from Labor to form the UAP, and he said that throughout the Depression, Lyons was the leader Australia needed. So, going into the 1930s, Lyons had the support of the nation and was by and large seen as a safe pair of hands. When it came to foreign policy, Lyons strongly supported Britain's policy of appeasement towards Hitler. If you don't know much about World War II, this was basically a policy of giving Hitler what he wanted to avoid another world war. It sounds dumb now because it reminds you of that English teacher that would let your mate Andy go on his laptop in class because he promised to be good, but everyone knew he was grinding on bubble struggle. However, most Europeans actually supported appeasement because they were simply desperate not to relive the Great War. Nonetheless, as Italy emerged as a fascist dictatorship and Japan as a military dictatorship, Lyons became concerned. In the 30s, both were moving towards alignment with Nazi Germany, and in 1936, the three would eventually sign the anti comintern Pact. Though wanting to avoid war, Lyons pressed the British government to have a concrete policy on what to do, particularly with Japan. Since Federation, Japan had been the age-old issue for Australia. They were rapidly modernising and a huge threat in the Pacific, but also British allies. However, with Japan invading Manchuria and leaving the League of Nations, Britain was now concerned about the safety of their Pacific colonies. In 1937, Lyons tried to capitalise on this by suggesting a non-aggression pact between major Pacific powers, but this failed to progress. Finally, Lyons strongly opposed the proposed marriage between King Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, an American twice divorcee. If you haven't watched The Crown, basically at the time, the Church of England refused to remarry divorcees whose spouse was still alive. The Constitution required the King to marry through the Church of England, and so this created a crisis, and ultimately, Edward stepped down to marry Wallace in 1937. Lyons actually telegraphed Edward asking him not to step down, and joined the British Conservative Party in criticising the marriage. This connection between the Tories and the UAP will be really important in just a moment. But back home, 1938 would be an especially important year for Lions. Firstly, there was the Aboriginal Day of Mourning. A couple of you guys have been asking why I haven't covered much Indigenous history so far, and it's for this reason. Simply, this is a political history series. In the same way I didn't cover Gallipoli, I haven't covered the social experiences of the Solon generations. And up until 1938, the Indigenous rights movement hadn't had a huge political breakthrough. But, on Australia Day 1938, Sydney was having a 150th anniversary party of the First Fleet's arrival. And in opposition, Jack Patton led 100 protesters on a silent march through Sydney into Australia Hall, where numerous Indigenous leaders gave stirring speeches on the need for equal rights. Now, that itself wasn't the key breakthrough, but rather Lyons actually agreed to meet with Patton. However, Lyons simply deflected, claiming that it was all a state government issue. 1938 would also prove to be crucial because Lyons was under attack from his protege, Robert Menzies. Lyons had promised Menzies that he'd hand over leadership to the Melbourneian lawyer, but it had reached the end of the decade and Menzies was still number two. 
After the UAP postponed a national insurance scheme in March 1938, Menzies resigned from cabinet and took any opportunity to undermine Lyons. What's the deal with airline food? I mean, is this stuff bad or what? Oh, that's not nice. Those chefs work really hard. And what's with those Starbucks, huh? They're everywhere. Uh, a lot of people want coffee. Interestingly, Murdoch was starting to back Menzies and he looked poised to take the leadership in 1939. To the nation's shock though, in April of 1939, Lyons suffered a heart attack and died. So Lyons was dead and Australia had a new prime minister. Now, just like with the modern coalition, the deal between the UAP and the country party was that the UAP would have the leader and the country party the deputy leader. So even though Menzies was really Lyons' number two, the country party's L Page was the technical deputy of the coalition government. So when Lyons died, Page became the acting prime minister. Now, Page said that he'd be happy to step down for whomever the UAP appointed, unless it was Menzies, in which case he'd end the coalition. You see, Page and Menzies didn't get on in the slightest, and Page even went public saying who could think of Menzies as an effective leader, and he even accused him of treachery for not fighting in World War II. But the UAP had been lining up Menzies to replace Lyons all decade, so they weren't going to roll over. And they appointed Menzies anyway just to call Page's bluff. Page really wasn't pleased with this, and convincing his party to end the coalition over his personal spat with Menzies would be tougher in practice than in theory. Page actually contacted former Prime Minister Stanley Bruce and offered his own seat for him to come back and lead the UAP, but Bruce would only agree to it if he could be an independent. On the 13th of September 1939, the country party lost patience with Page and gave him the boot to be replaced by Archie Cameron, who happily rejoined the coalition. But just have another look at that date. In September 1939. Ring any bells? September 1st, 1939. There's something about that date. So this is where we get into the World War II stuff, because while Australia was figuring out its leader, Hitler was busy invading Poland. Now, Parliament immediately accepted Menzies' assumption that Australia was to fight in this war to help stop Germany, and the perception around Menzies is that he was a massive suck up to Britain during the war. I'm going to let you be the verdict of that though. So in 1939, it was still being called the Phony War, but by May of 1940, Germany had launched this invasion of France and Belgium, and in Britain, Winston Churchill had replaced Neville Chamberlain to form an all-party parliament under his leadership. Basically what that meant was that there was a coalition between the two major British parties, Labour and the Conservatives. So basically no parties. Now Australia had gone on a military enlistment drive and massively increased manufacturing, and this also soaked up any remaining unemployment. Menzies also passed the National Security Act to conscript further forces, though they couldn't be sent overseas. And a second Australian Imperial force was also established. So right now, it sounds like Menzies was willing to do whatever Britain needed in a fairly similar manner to Australia in World War I. Well, it isn't quite that simple. You see, Menzies made it clear to Britain that Japan was the big difference for Australia between World War I and World War II. In the Great War, Japan was an ally, but now under the anti term Pact, they were allies of Germany and therefore a major enemy outside of Europe. Menzies said that Australia's participation would be entirely dependent on whether Japan created a need to defend. But to once again push back in the other direction, Menzies had helped create the Japanese military machine. In 1938, dockers in Port Kembla, that's just south of Wollongong, refused to ship pig iron to Japan out of fear that Japan would use it to attack Australia. Menzies demanded that they stop their protests because foreign policy was for elected officials. Eventually, the workers relented and the iron was sent to Japan, but this led to Menzies becoming known as Pig Iron Bob. So it was tough to quite work out Menzies' actual position on Japan itself. New Zealand Prime Minister Richard Casey sent over extra forces to Europe and he encouraged Menzies to do the same. Ultimately, Menzies joined and in January of 1941, he sent the Australian 6th Division over to Egypt to be used for an offensive in France. So in 1940, Australia had a federal election and going into it, Menzies tried to paint himself as the Australian Churchill. He even went as far as proposing a no-party system like Churchill, but Labor leader John Curtin refused. Campaign slogans such as cast your vote for unity and an all-in war effort and back the government that's backing Churchill were used and the UAP held on to government. However, there was a three seat swing towards Labor as the UAP lost eight seats. Not a great sign in a time of crisis. Essentially, the UAP country party coalition had 36 seats, Federal Labor and Lang Labor held 36 seats and there were two independents, Arthur Coles and Alexander Wilson who agreed to side with the UAP. If at any point the UAP lost these independents though, they'd lose government. 
To make matters worse, just before the election, three cabinet members, including the ministers of army and aviation and the army's chief of staff, were all killed in a plane crash in Canberra. 10 people were killed when a Lockheed Hudson bomber crashed en route from Melbourne to Canberra during World War II. One of the biggest turning points in the whole of Australian history, I would say. On board were three of Robert Menzies' senior ministers and close friends, Brigadier Geoffrey Street, James Fairburn and Sir Henry Gullett. When they died, their seats became vacant. There were going to be three by-elections. Prime Minister Menzies changed his mind and called an early general election. So, by the skin of his teeth, Menzies was still governing and in 1941 he went to England to protest its neglect of Australian interests during the war, particularly that Churchill saw no need to better fortify the island of Singapore. Churchill claimed that it was an impenetrable fortress, but a year later, history would prove Menzies right. Not only that, but Menzies had little success with Churchill on Australian soldiers in Greece. Menzies argued that the Anzacs in Greece were not properly equipped for war and that an allied Balkan front that included Turkey was essential for fighting against Germany and Italy. So Menzies returned from Britain very unsuccessful and to make matters worse, while Menzies was away, his UAP was plotting to take him down. Menzies returned to a session of special cabinet where all the UAP members were to physically sign a letter declaring who they were siding with. Under pressure, Menzies resigned as the Prime Minister and leader of the party. Just like with Lyons, the new leader of the country party, Arthur Fadden, became acting Prime Minister while the UAP decided who it would nominate. Remember, Parliament was dependent upon the two independents, Arthur Coles and Alexander Wilson. And so when Arthur Fadden proposed a new budget, it was rejected and the two sided with Labour, bringing them out of a decade-long opposition. The nation's new Prime Minister was to become the one who's often now known as the best of them all, John Curtin. Thanks for watching. Stuff gets really real next week. Just as Curtin takes office, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor and begins its rapid expansion towards Australia. For 12 months, the nation remained in constant fear about a Japanese invasion and it needed decisive leadership. And you'll get a chance to see if the historians are right in saying Curtin provided it. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.